It's great. It's good to see that that sweet basil logo, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I did this talk with Steve Wilson, you know, and he was also like, I, I had this on, and he was like, man. That's yeah, it. I love it. I love it, man. Those, those, those were the days, some great days. Yeah, you, you played there probably, right? I did. Uh, I mean, I, I mostly just remember doing some amazing uh, listening yeah, there sure. at Basil in, in the, from the mid-80s oh, yeah. up, up into the 90s. And then um, I actually joined the Jazz Messengers there yeah. uh, in December of 89. So, so yeah, we played about three different week-long engagements there. Uh, oh, wow. Amazing. Okay, well, that's appropriate then. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I was a baby. <laughs> I was 22, 23 years old. And, oh, wow. And uh, probably had no business being there playing with the great Art Blakey and, and all the great messengers. But but I was there and I uh, did a lot of learning. <laughs> in, in, yeah, in, I want to ask you about uh, Art later, but... Yeah. Uh, I just I just want to start with with uh, you know you not being a kid anymore. <laughs> it's just like I watched some footage of you playing at the Smalls. You know I love the small streams what they're doing and it's quite amazing. And you know your quintet from end of November and uh, you know you seem so comfortable being a band leader. And uh, oh, thank you, thank you. You know, or some footage from Chris Cafe, I think, from Philadelphia with Steve Wilson as well. We mentioned Steve and, you, you, yeah. you know, how, how do you see your development as a band leader or how do you see it, uh, look at it now, you know, after a really long career being a band leader, actually? I mean, wow, man, thank you for the question. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's always a pleasure when when you can just be surrounded with the, the greatest musicians you know that you can think of and um so i i i think the secret for me and it's no secret is is just to let it happen yeah. and try to stay out of the way a little bit and interesting yeah. uh, be a good facilitator um and you know there are certain roles at as a band leader that where you want to try to center things and perhaps uh present repertoire whether it's your own originals or just mm -hmm. selecting standards to play and and also drawing on your side people um in terms of what they bring as composers and if they have an idea for for an arrangement or a, a treatment mm -hmm. of a given yeah. tune you know so i my goal has always been that that it feels like our band like this is our band and it's it's not you know my band and and i i i don't know i never felt comfortable with that and i i think the music really thrives when everybody feels invested and yeah. and, and, and able to contribute and just be themselves you know and uh the great larry willis uh, who i worked with a long time and we were dear friends and and he was a, a great mentor to me and just great friend colleague hero all of it and you know he he used to talk about that uh you know that uh i think miles davis told him once don't ever hire somebody you don't trust <laughs> yeah and yeah. So, yeah. so you want to trust the cats you know you you want to trust people that you hire and 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 then things just kind of take care of themselves and um art blakey would always say uh about the messengers you know he or, and just jazz music in general he would say this ladies and gentlemen this here is democracy at work you know and and it's it's I, ideally that that really is true um so it, you know whether whether i'm the leader mm. or you know or not um it's just great to be in the band and uh yeah. You know, so I, I just always want it to feel like our band. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 
is, is has this grown or like through the years the, are you comfortable in this role i mean like you said i, I know you you know I, I think i saw i think you were in part of the big band with Kristen mcbride right I think yeah I, I watched yeah. that band in vienna i think you were in trombone i, I know steve yeah. was steve wilson was was there and michael dees and some other guys but and when i watched the uh, Kristen mcbride leading that band it's just like speaking of family there's this joy and uh how have you developed this role as a band leader? Were you comfortable with it from the beginning or was this like a development? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, th th it, it's a good question. Uh, Christian is a, is a shining yeah. example of this, as, yeah. as you know. And you, you hit it on the head. It's, it's family. It's joy. Yeah. Uh, he's pr proud of everybody. Um, and even though he he is a star and he is the leader and, and there, there's no question about that but he really is just one of the guys you know like when we're touring and playing together with, with the big band and and it's just so fun and um i think he gets a great amount of joy when when everybody's thriving and everyone's having a good time yeah. and so that's a great example you bring up uh, christian and you know uh for me personally um, I've led groups off and on for 30 years now. Yeah. It's kind of hard to believe. Um, but I've also been a sideman all these years too and played with a lot of different great, great uh, musicians and, and in some really great situations. And so you, you kind of pick things up. You, you learn. You're learning. You're, you're learning from the best of the best. And yeah. you sort of kind of take notes, I guess, uh, subconsciously. Um, about how to go about things and maybe some things not to do or that just wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't work so well for you um yeah. it might work for someone else and um but i i want to lead my own groups yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, I sense that yeah yeah going forward yeah i um and and i write a lot of music uh, i can't help it. it it just these tunes just keep coming somehow and and it, talk about joy, man. It is the greatest feeling in the world to have a tune you've been sitting on for a couple years or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and then finally write it down. Try not to overwrite the lead sheet so yeah, it's too that's, yeah. You know what I mean? Like just, just enough, and then present it to your 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 colleagues and and uh and then just play it together and, and usually they tend to kind of play themselves and then this this thing happens you know they you know what i'm talking about like it just takes on a life of its own and uh it's just the greatest thing man to behold and 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 sometimes these tunes like you go oh my god what have i done like <laughs> like I, I i can't even play this it's so hard you know yeah um, yeah but, uh, but but usually no it's it's just it feels personal and then it feels like it's it's not even your song. It's um, the way I've been putting it for some years is it's just trying to be a good host to the notes. Yeah, that's nicely put. Yeah. The notes are just passing through, man. They've they've been there way before you and I, and they're going to be around way after we're out of here. And, and if you just try to be a good host to the notes, um, things tend to work out, you know. How's your story when putting notes down on the sheet? You know, like I listen to correlations a lot, and um, you know, there's some beautiful music you wrote, like that Ambarcadero and Batista's Revenge, and you know, even and if I go even back years, of course, like you said, you've been, I think, an extremely prolific composer, and it seems to be easy for you. But like, what's your process when? Let's say for correlations. How did you write music? What, what what's the story there? How do you begin? How do you? I guess you need a deadline, like everyone, right? That helps sometimes, <laughs> um, or, or or when you and the whether it's uh, working with the record label in in this case, uh, Smoke Jazz, yeah. uh, Smoke Sessions, uh, Paul Stash and and company there, uh, and and then you agree on personnel, or usually it's just a case of a case of availability you know who who can make it and who you know when you finally get a date and all those things come into play and and you have your idea of of um 
you know, uh, musicians you really would love yeah. to record with and, and th that you have worked with. And so when all those things kind of come together, <clears throat> what will happen is you get this other like boost of, of uh, a booster, <laughs> a yeah. booster shot of, of inspiration. <laughs> and then, and then yeah. This is this is a better booster to talk about, and I. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah, please <laughs> let's let's stay on this route. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've had enough of the other one, and yeah. and um, and so so you get this extra uh, inspiration like a week before the session, and I, I invariably I'll write a new tune or two with the cats in mind. It just mm, happens. Yeah. It just it just it just wells up out of you, and um, one case or one instance where, where this was the case was uh, in, I think it was December of 2005. I can't believe it's been that long. And I had a, it was my last crisscross jazz record date as, as a leader. I think it was my seventh one. And, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, and I had been working quite a bit with Roy Hargrove. Off oh, yeah, those and records, and update, and yeah, I love that stuff. Eloquence and all that, man. <laughs> oh, you, thank you, man. Yeah, and and so... You know, I I thought uh, the band was set. Peter Bernstein and myself mm -hmm. and uh, Anthony Wamsey, Nat Reeves, Joe Farnsworth. So I, th I mean, wow, golden. Yeah. And so then I thought, you know, I was playing with Roy with the Dizzy All Stars and and oh, uh, okay. And we were having so much fun. And so I I called him and and called his manager and uh, and uh, Larry Clothier, and he said, well, you know, Roy Roy's available. He uh, he can only do three tunes because of his contract. But he'd, he'd love to make it. And this is like a week, 10 days before. So when I knew, wow, we can have Roy on three tunes, I just instantly wrote this tune, Grove's Groove. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened, man. I was so delighted that he could play on one of my records. Like, wow, man, you know, after all those years. And and uh, as you say, we, we, did, we did another one called Eloquence with Hank yeah. Jones and... That was also Nat Reeves and Joe Farnsworth and Steve Nelson played yeah. on that one too. It's a beautiful one. Thank you. And um, so you know, man, I I wrote this tune, brought it to the session, and Roy loved it. And we played it, did a couple takes, felt great. <clears throat> a couple years went by, excuse me, and I get a call out of the blue from Benny Golson, who I knew, but I had never worked with. Um of course, you know, I've dreamt of working with him. And so I sure. got the call and I was eating cereal at the time. And, and my, my, my ex-wife, my first wife, uh, Mary, she answered the phone and she said, uh, yeah, it's, it's for you. And my mouth is full. I said, oh, you know, just, just tell my call back. She said, oh, no, I, I, I think you want to take this. It's, <laughs> it's Benny Golson from Frankfurt. Germany, oh, and I'll never forget. I had Cheerios in my mouth. I said, "It's Benny Golson," <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, "Oh my goodness!" And so <laughs> Benny told me he heard this record that Jerry oh, Teekins wow. gave him a stack of crisscross records over in Europe, and that one of them was mine. It's called Update, and there's this tune on there, Stevie. It's called Grove's Groove, and that's what the music is all about. It's got the oh, whole wow. <laughs> I love this song and I, I want to record it with you. And I'm like, what? Like, and sure enough, a couple of years later, a year and a half later, he formed the new, the new jazz tet. And we uh, went in the studio and he said, it's going to be the first track we record. Oh, wow, open man. our performances with. Oh, and so we did. And uh, it was Eddie Henderson and Mike LaDon, Buster Williams and Carl Allen. And, <laughs> And myself and they had been working with benny quite a bit of yeah. course and you know i got to s inhabit the the spot of my hero and my mentor my dear friend and the great curtis fuller fuller and, yeah wow and just to be in that place and and then have benny record one of my <laughs> tunes and i you know I, I kept thinking man we record your tunes you know like like it's not the other way around so that's, oh, that's, that's a highlight. Yeah. yeah, that was a highlight of my career for sure. And, and just a dream come true, but it back to your point, like it, that tune came about from, from the update session, just being inspired. Pure joy. Yeah. 
Roy is going to be there. I got to write one for him. And and I'm so glad that we honored him, Grove's yeah. Groove, while while he, he got to play it. Like he he was right there, you know. Um, and I'm I'm just grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, did, did you guys, uh, did you ever play with Roy then, like under your own name? Like that he actually played gigs with your group or? Not too often. Uh, I tried. <laughs> to, yeah, you know, yeah, I know. Yeah, it was heavy uh, to get him. Yeah. He was busy. We played very often at different junctures um, in a small group setting with John Lee and the Dizzy Gillespie alumni mm, All-Stars. Okay. With the big band too, and Roy would sit right behind me, second trumpet, and I'm second trombone. But then we got to do uh, many gigs over the years, um, from the mid 2000s up until just three years ago, mm -hmm. uh, before Roy passed. And um, I was just uh, remembering this uh, yesterday. I was speaking with with Linda Moody, you know James James Moody's Moody, wife, yeah. you know, and. And just telling her what a thrill it was um <clears throat> excuse me in october of 2008 october of 2009 so back to back years a year apart the gillespie all-stars for those gigs happened to be moody and myself and roy on the front oh, line wow man and it we we never used a sheet of music we we just it was so easy man it was like i i i don't know if those gigs ever got documented in any kind man, of way shit, yeah. but man that was six nights six nights 24 sets of music a year apart i think cyrus chestnut was playing and and uh john lee and maybe dennis mccrell one year and lewis nash one year oh wow man, beautiful and uh roberta gambarini i think sang mm -hmm. and Man, was that a treat! And yeah, so you know, Roy and I, 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 I always loved to blend with him and and play notes with him, and <clears throat> we we all miss him mm -hmm. very much. And Moody, of course, and Jimmy Heath, and Sly yeah. Hampton, my my hero, mental. Yeah, so, lately, yeah, it's been yeah. Barry Harris, we just lost. Sure. I mean, yeah. Harold Mayburn, Larry Willis, a couple years ago, I played with both of them. A oh, lot. Yeah, I know. I, I love Harold. Yeah, amazing. Oh, God. Wow. Those records you did with him. Yeah, I love those. Oh, man, he's just the best. And many others. You know, Jackie McLean was my real mentor um, early on. And, and then, of course, we just lost Chick. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's like it's kind of hard to believe, you know, like – Freddie Hubbard, I got to work with him quite a bit. Horace Silver, I got to work with a little oh, bit. Yeah. All these old school guys, yeah. Hank Jones, Cedar Walton. Uh, so I'm I'm just, and many others, I, I, I'm just so grateful to have those experiences and learn from them. And, and <clears throat> you know, now I'm I'm proud of, of all the great young players coming up. Yeah. And there's an alto player named Sarah Hanahan. Um, Hmm, Look know. out for her. Oh, okay. Man. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'll check her out. She can. Oh yeah. She's she's on the scene in New York now, and she went to the Hart School a few years back, and she's got the fire <laughs> on that alto, man. Let me tell you. And Josh Bruno, great trumpet player, and um, oh yeah, he's yeah, yeah. he's on uh, your record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and Jonathan Barber, the young drummer, and he, he just. Matt Dwanzik is a great bassist. There's just a whole crew um, that I enjoy. How, 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 how did you assemble these guys for correlations, by the way? How, how did that crew happen? I mean, you're, well, you're mentioning these guys now, but like... Yeah, Desron Douglas is yeah. on that record. And, um, Wayne Escoffrey, yeah. Wayne Escoffrey, yeah. So there's a lot of Hartford, Hart School, Jackie McLean legacy, uh, generationally uh, connection. On, on many of my recordings over the years. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Xavier Davis was just, uh, he's not a Hartford guy, but he and I played with the New Jazz Composers Octet mm. with Freddie Hubbard years ago and, and, and many other situations. And he's just so wonderful and great to work with. So that came together very naturally. And uh, 
and Jonathan Barber and Desron and Josh and Wayne and, and we had a ball and, and we did do some gigs we had some concerts and some club dates and it was starting to happen you know and then then this this thing called yeah. COVID-19 showed up and I, yeah. <laughs> but you know I, I look forward to revisiting that group um I I collaborate all the time for many years with Nat Reeves the, the great bassist yeah he's amazing yeah. Yep, he's a mentor and dear friend, and and uh, he's got a band right now called the State of Emergency Band, um, and Josh and I play, and Sarah, the young alto player, I told oh, you about. Oh, okay. Sarah Hanahan. Sometimes Eddie Henderson will do it, and then it's Rick Germanson on piano mm -hmm. and, and Eric McPherson, Emac. Oh man, really? Band. Oh wow, gotta check it out. It's it's a band, man. That is a happening band, and uh, it's got the that old school feeling of a unit and, and Emac and Nat and I, we learned this from Jackie McLean. Like we were part of that in the nineties. And, um, in fact, I got a picture back here. Oh man. Yeah. Eric's back in there. Nat is J Mac and uh, young me. And that's Raymond Williams, a great trumpeter from new Orleans. And there's Larry Willis. That's my wife, Bobina. <laughs> She's she's uh, Abana Coomson Davis. She's a great singer and and also ethics professor and uh, oh, wow. just a Renaissance woman, man. She's she's but she can sing really. <laughs> yeah. So I look forward to doing some things with her. Yeah. Uh, my son Tony Davis, the guitarist, he's living in New York and uh, really doing his thing and. Um, he and I did a lot of playing together a few years back when he was coming up in Hartford yeah. and then he first moved to New York. So I, I look forward to, you know, kind of, it's been hard during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, it's been a difficult time now. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I look forward to kind of reconnecting with him because he's a great comper. He's, he's easy to play with. And oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. 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 And, and then the group one for all. Um, oh, sure. Yeah which has been i mean just like home <laughs> you know playing with <clears throat> excuse me with uh those Jim guys Tom, yeah. eric alexander and david hazeltine and joe farnsworth and uh, john weber sometimes peter washington who yeah. was the original bassist and and i think uh it looks like we're gonna have a recording session in a couple months yeah jim so, told me yeah Oh, Jim told you. Okay. Yeah, Jim told me. Like, there's something brew, something's happening, maybe in small sort of yeah. or somewhere. And yeah, we we hope everything <laughs> cooperates. And but that band has been uh, a cornerstone uh, for for all of us, really. And uh, you know, certainly for me, um, I I almost can't believe looking back over 25 years just yeah. that, uh, the body of work there it's like wow we really did a lot you know we did a lot of writing and playing and i i love that band and talk about blending on a front line yeah yeah incredible with eric and jim it's how did that one happen by the way one, one for all what, what, what how did you because they played together a little before already right joe and uh and jim i yeah. think and eric i think yep Yep, and I I kind of met the guys uh, in New York um, at Augie's, which oh, was yeah. up the west side before it became Smoke. Oh, and yeah. We kind of started there, and uh, I would just kind of come by after like this photograph. Uh, that was the Village Vanguard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was playing, in, you know, I was living in Hartford back up there and starting to teach, and and really in under Jackie McLean's auspices in those years, and. And, uh, but I, you know, I wanted to still be in New York as much as I could. And it's only two hours away. So, yeah, sure. um, so we'd finish the gig and I would just stop into Augie's cause they would go late. And, uh, I knew Joe a little and, and then I'm, you know, kind of fell in with, with what they were doing and John Farnsworth too, on, on great trombonist. Who's Trombone, yeah, sure. Yeah. He's a great musician, writes great tunes and. So that, you know, it kind of became a a thing. And then they had it, like you said, they just had it going on. They did not need me. <laughs> but 
just like Jackie and Renee McLean, like they did not need me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they made a spot for me. J Mac and, and Renee did. And, and uh, so my, my buddies, you know, my colleagues, Rotundi and Eric, and I would just kind of find a third voice, yeah. you know, find good harmonies, just kind of try to fit in. And it just took on this sound and this life. And then we started to play because uh, often those gigs were, were no chords. It was like, Dwayne Bruno, God bless his soul. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, or Tyler Mitchell, Mitchell, or Ugano Kegwo, or John Weber. You know, many uh, different bassists. Um, Mike Zisman, who's out in San Francisco, and so you know we would just play without the chords. And so then uh, Michael Weiss played with us a little bit, and, that, and then he started a sextet and started writing, wow. and, and that was fantastic. And then Dave Hazeltine sat in with us once and something really special happened there. And he started to write for us and man, it was like mouthwatering, like, oh, these yeah. voicings and it's just yeah. it's so swinging, you know? So, and then uh, Peter Washington started playing with us and wow, that rhythm section is unbelievable. And it, it just, it just happened, you know? And in those early days, We'd finish playing at Smalls or something, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, hanging out afterwards. And someone would say, "Man, this is this is kind of a band, man. This is sound, feeling pretty good." And the, who's the leader? I don't know. I'm not the leader. Well, I'm not the leader, man. I'm not the leader. You know, it was it was hilarious. It was like hot potato, like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we just decided to make it a collective, and um, Farnsworth kind of jokingly said, man, why not call it like Stevie D's tune we did with, with the messengers with our yeah. baby? Call it one for all. <laughs> you know, and it just kind of stuck. And uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, Still here to tell about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's rare. I mean, you know, nowadays to, to keep it going for such a long time, like more or less the same collective of people, you know, that's a tough one. Yeah not always easy no yeah no yeah. um how about you man what like what 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 projects do you have going lately oh man i have to send you i, I did like now uh solo eric dolphy on acoustic guitar wow yeah i, I did like i took i took all of his 28 compositions and i arranged them for solo acoustic six and 12 strings so it just kept, it's coming wow. out next week and already People are really excited. That's fantastic. Said, yeah, that's, that's been a uh, that's been a hell of a yeah undertaking. Like so much I, respect and joy, and you know. I can just, imagine. That's no. that's incredible, man! Wow, congratulations! Yeah, I, I can't wait. To do that. Yeah, I'll send you a link. It's 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 you know taking all these beautiful tunes, serene and something sweet, something tender, whatever, out to lunch trying to arrange this for a 12 string or a six string i was like man first transcribing then like figuring out what to do with it <laughs> that was fun oh, man I, I can imagine man that, wow that's that's a, that's amazing yeah I, lo I love that you know eric's been like my my main besides ornette heroes that i started to play jazz so that's and you know co covid caused this so there's some something <laughs> some positive out of this i guess you know when you're at home like what to do well okay let's do this and yeah so this yeah is, yeah I, think now, so. you're you're totally right it's it's been a time to uh take stock and and for me um at, at 54 years old like i i can look back 35 years and kind of was was that me like you know like was was i there for all those things and and it's it's a great feeling to try to uh, just appreciate and absorb all these experiences and your career and just all the wonderful people on and off the bandstand, you know, that you meet and interact with uh, just by virtue of being a jazz musician, you know, and you meet yeah. all these cool people and uh, it's just, uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And oh, I, sure. Uh, yeah. You know, but for that, all the hardships we go through and oh, the, yeah. sure. the up and downs and, you know, the gig is on, it's off, it's canceled, it's on. It's, you know, the, no, it's not this date, it's this date. Oh, the tour is canceled. The tour is happening. You know, woo, it, it can be a roller coaster for us. Um, 
especially the last couple of years. I mean, my yeah, yeah, it's been yeah bizarre, actually. Yeah, but yeah. I, I wanted to ask but, you, Steve, about the catch you here like already for one for all. You know, the tune you wrote for art, actually, and yeah, <laughs> how did you know you were twenty two? You said and kind of one for all. You know, the group I see it like as extension almost of the Blakey legacy in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, but how did you feel? I think you were one of the last recruits of the messengers, right? I, I was the last. The last. Wow. Okay. And uh, not just last trombone chair. I, I was the last messenger, as it as it turned out. Um, how did the gig happen? Yeah, by the I was way, there about... how how did the call happen? Or do you remember? Oh, this is a fun story. Right. <laughs> so. My mentor, my teacher, Jackie McLean, um, and this is before I ever played in his band. I was finishing school in Hartford at the Hart School, and he, he called me in his office one day, and he said, Hey, son, sit down. Shut the door. And, he, you know, this is back before computers and cell phones and any sure. of that. And he had his, his Rolodex on the desk, and he flips the paper, you know, and I see Art Blakey, 212, you know. Oh, he man. picks up the phone. He said, I'm going to call Buhana. Like I promised you, son, I'm going to call Buhana and, and tell him about you. But he had me be there for it, you know. So he calls and I hear, the, I hear, hello, you know, on the, on the phone. And it's, wow, I mean, man, can you imagine? I was 21 then. Can you imagine just 1988 or so? Oh, shit. Or 89, you know, in, in there. Uh, I mean, what a thrill. So he he told him about me. He said, uh, I got a little trombone player here named Stevie D, Steve Davis. He's getting ready to graduate and move to New York. He's going to make his move to New York soon. And uh, if, if you ever need a trombone player, Art, I, this little cat can play. And, oh, man. and then I had to do the rest. Um, you know, and I never stood in the same room as the two of them. But I, I went and uh, to Sweet Basil. Oh, <laughs> wow. T-shirt, man. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Yeah, it really evokes the memories. I'm just seeing it. I was like, "Wow, man, it's amazing." And and I went down and uh, like so many of us and so many other musicians, um, and sat in on Sunday night. I, you know, I went and introduced myself earlier in the week, and and Art remembered who he, oh, he wow. said. Oh, he said, "Oh, so that's you. Okay, bring your horn back Sunday and sit in." And I did, and there were so many horn players there, and we all played on Monin. And I remember when I was, I was one of the last ones to play, and I finally got up to the mic, and the mic had been moved, you know, up and down for different people. And so I'm playing, and the mic just went, shoo, like it, the stand wasn't tight, and it just yeah. went shoo, all the way down. <laughs> And man, you kind of needed to play into that mic a little bit with Art Blakey, man, like, you know. At least on that bandstand. And so I wound up, you know, playing and then I kind of finished playing down and I thought, well, I'm toast. Like, you know, like, well, at least I got to play Monin once with Art Blakey, the great Art Blakey. What a thrill. And uh -huh. I thought that, yeah, that's the end of that, you know. And uh, a few months later, around the Christmas time, Art, I had been going to hear the band whenever they were in town. I was there almost every night, just hanging around just listening soaking it up and and i had been going to hear the messengers regularly since 1984 or five oh, yeah. so and all the different great versions of the bands you know and and so art told me he walked past i was sitting with valerie panamarv the great <laughs> trumpeter and valerie had been very kind to me up in hartford uh, he used to come up there and play and Eddie Henderson also and Claudio Roditi, God bless his soul. And, and, and a lot of musicians would come and play at the 880 club in Hartford. And there was a pianist, Don De Palma. God, he just passed away recently too. And he was great. And so, you know, I was the kid, the skinny kid with hair <laughs> on the trombone. And so they let me sit in. And so Valerie remembered me from Hartford. So I'm sitting at the table with him. And Art said hello to him, and then he and then he whispered in my ear, "Don't go far." <laughs> and I thought, "Is he talking to me? Like, am I hearing things?" Like I, <laughs> and sure enough, man, the day after I I went to my parents in uh, 
Binghamton, New York, which is upstate, yeah. just for Christmas Day, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and the band was off Christmas, and I was going to come back and just be around, just in case, just, <clears throat> and I get a phone call at my parents' house from Jackie McLean oh, wow. on December 26th. And he, and he says, hey, son, you, you, I'm going to give you Buhana's number. You need to call him right now. He's he's looking for you, man. And so it's like 3 in the afternoon, and, and my mom had answered the phone. It's 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 Professor McLean. You, you know, <laughs> it was like, wow, man. So I call the 212 number, and the phone gets passed around about five different times. And then finally, hello, you know, it's Art Blakey. And he said, I'm, I'm going to need you down to club tonight, sweet Basil, I'm going to need you down the club tonight, Steve. Can you make it? Just, I'm just, you know, jaw on the table. Like, you got to be kidding. And yes, sir. And uh, my friend Tony Cadlick, great mm -hmm. trumpeter yeah. in New York, and we grew up together. Oh, really? So he, oh, well. Yeah. So we had driven back to Binghamton together. So I called him up and said, Tony, you aren't going to believe this, man. Like, we have to go now. Like, <laughs> Please, man, I'm begging you. Can you? He said, and so he said some words I won't say here. <laughs> you know, bleeping this and all my, you know, I'll be there in 30 minutes. And he dropped everything. God bless him. Picked me up. We raced back to, because he, he lived in New York too at that time. We raced down to the city, three hour drive through the Catskill Mountains. Get back down there around seven o'clock or so. The gig's at 9.30. New York was a later town then, you know, for the jazz clubs and stuff. And and I got to run back to my apartment in Manhattan, get, get my suit and tie. Yeah. I had my horn with me. And I had, like, penny loafers, like, decent shoes and some khaki pants and a button-down shirt. But, you know, sure. my mom liked it if I dressed up for the holidays a little bit, you know. So I look kind of preppy, you know. <laughs> Oh man, I go to get my keys to get in my car and drive. And I, where, where are my keys? I was so young that I left my keys hanging on my parents' keychain, key hook, at, in, at on Crary Avenue in Binghamton, New York. So I have no apartment keys. So I go to knock on Tony's door up in the Bronx. You know, I, I just, you know, he says, "Man, what's the matter?" I said, "I, I, I got. Can I?" I got to wear a suit and tie. Like, what am I going to do? He said, man, my roommate, Ken Scharf, he's a trumpeter. He said, he, I didn't know him. Yeah, I, I know him since, you know, it's hilarious. But he says, yeah, you know, he's doing a cruise gig. <laughs> he's gone for a few weeks. I think he's kind of about your size. <laughs> and so oh, I wore a stranger's clothes just so I could have, have an actual suit jacket and tie and I and I came down to the gig, no rehearsal, wearing somebody else's clothes. <laughs> Put that in the curriculum. So, oh man! And yeah, and it all it all happened from there, and uh, it was just amazing, man. Just amazing time, and I uh, I learned a lot. I, I really did. And uh, but but the tune, you know, uh, when we had our record date, and mm. it was, I just wanted to write something that had that spirit and somehow that title seemed to be appropriate and, and did art ask I'm you so for, glad for music or just it just happened to her uh yeah he he kind of he he it was sort of a given for everybody to bring something mm, yeah. but you know, brian lynch and javon jackson yeah. and were, were in the band dale barlow australian great tenor player um jeff keezer yeah on piano yeah Yeah. And and Essie at Essie. And so uh, at the end of the second day of recording, Art looked over at me. I was the the newbie, you know, the new kid. And he looks over and he says, hey, what about you? Didn't you bring one? So I said, yeah, well, go ahead and get it together then. And so we ran it down. Dee, 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 you know, dee, 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 dee. And, you know, and he's talking to Kenwood Denard. Oh yeah, and Richard Richard T, the keyboardist. Keyboardist. They yeah. came from another session, and they're he's over there cutting up with 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 the guys, and then he, and 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 then he about five minutes we we ran it over, and then he 
grabs his sticks. He comes back in the booth. And he sits down. You know, He says, okay, let's knock this out. Like the last tune of the date. And I kind of sheepishly said, well, uh, uh, hey, Art, you know, do, do you want to run it down once for No, I got it. Wow, so, man. He had it. And uh, and we just did a take. And, and I remember thinking that then, too. Like, well, they, there's already so much music recorded. It's all so great. They probably won't even use it, you know. But at least I got the feeling, you know, yeah. like playing one of my own little and sure enough, man, when after he passed away, and then they, uh, what was that? Uh, A&M Records. They they put yeah. it out, and it was the first tune on the record and the title track. I had nothing to do with that. I, oh, okay, amazing. It's it's a dream, you know. It's a dream come true. So I'm I'm very very grateful for for that experience. And Brian Lynch kind of kidded with me. He said, "Yeah, man, nice title." <laughs> You know, because because he had been no, writing was, yeah. incredible, yeah, you know, yeah. And, but it's all there, you know. And and I was a rookie, and um, hopefully playing a little better now. Oh come <laughs> on, man! <laughs> <Killing> was, man. <laughs> uh, Beautiful, yeah. But uh, how did that, like, uh, you, you know, like the, the, you becoming? I mean, we we started to you being a band leader, and. Uh, how did the Chris Cross records happen? I mean, you you know the Jaunt, and I love that one with Eric on, on drums, McPherson, and you know it's such a peculiar band. Oh yeah. Uh, how did this story of you start starting to become a band leader begin? Man, um, some of my friends and great colleagues, um, Eric Alexander, mm -hmm. Mark Turner, uh, Brad Meldow. Peter Bernstein, they all recommended me to Jerry Teakins. Mm, okay. I, th I was about 28 years old before I ever made my first leader record. Um, so it, it took some time and, but I, I think that was good because I had, I had a lot of developing to do, you know, um, in those Hartford J Mac years that I was playing in Jackie's band. Yeah. And, and, and then when we were not working, uh, I was a young teacher in in the Hartford um, yeah. at the at the at the university, and then at the Artist Collective also, and and there was a very vibrant scene up there. So I was developing and playing with some great musicians up there, and um, in and out of New York, and um, uh, my dear friend Mike Derubo, the great alto mm -hmm. player, he and I had a band called the Explorers, and. Uh, tenor player named Chris Jensen who's also from from Binghamton he was in Hartford and uh, yeah I, I could name a lot of musicians yeah. so um and then you know Derubo I like anyway so I Jerry heard my name enough and he finally gave me a date of my own um and uh that, that's how that started and and then I played on a John Swana record yeah uh, the trumpet oh, yeah. in Philly yeah and and I'm looking over, and, and there's Kenny Barron, Peter Washington, and Kenny Washington, and Eric Alexander, and John, and me, and I, you know, I, I gulp, you know, <laughs> and that was one of my early record dates, and and uh, it just kind of snowballed from there, and um, then one for all took yeah. shape, and yes, yeah, sir. Uh, wow, I'm just looking. And back and then you know i was in a position a few years later to recommend mike derubo and recommend jimmy green who was oh yeah very yeah, sure yeah and he was from hartford and playing great at a very young age and um so it's it's kind of like a you know a cycle and um, that's how it is yeah yeah, yeah and then it all just kind of happened from there and um I'm, I'm just looking back on it these days like I said, just almost in disbelief. Like, man, I I really was able to be a part of this and and really work for thirty years. Like, just and you know, it doesn't make you rich. <laughs> it doesn't make you wealthy financially. But I've done okay. And, and yeah, but just like this experience, you know, on a personal level and on the musical and you know. Yeah. development level as a person i guess and a musician of course that's that's what, what 
in the end that's, also counts you know that i mean that's the main thing probably so that's why we do it yeah, yeah it's, exactly. it's a way of life and uh you just i can't imagine doing anything else i, I mean you know i i have other interests but oh, sure. yeah. you can't I can't imagine not being a musician first and foremost. It's just, it's so pure, you know, it's yeah. like the, it is. the purest w way to express yourself and communicate and connect with human beings. And I, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't come up with it much better, you know, than yeah, that. No, sir. I, I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and it's just so fulfilling to play and write and yeah and, yeah uh, wow man so uh, otherwise uh, i know we, we are short on time i just wanted to ask you one more thing i mean uh, sure. uh about your story with chick because we mentioned him also and ah. it's kind it's kind of you know when i look at you Excuse the guys me. you worked with like up before you played with chick it's kind of chick then pops in almost as a surprise if you know what i mean like how did the story with Chick? Once you hear, once I hear it with the band, it sounds so natural. And but like, I wouldn't first connect you with that band. Like, how did the story with Chick happen? Actually, yeah. Thank you for for considering that and 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 asking it that way because, um, I I mean, of course, I was a fan of Chicks. Um, not so much the electric band and that stuff. Sure, I had yeah, really yeah. much of that, um, but I really loved his playing, particularly on on the the uh, with Blue Mitchell and like you know uh, straight up and down and what's that record called Boss Horn I think and mm. uh, you know some of Chick's uh, '60s stuff and and of course Return to Forever. I mean you sure. know it, it, everybody knows how influential and great that is and. Um, but I never, in my wildest dreams, thought I would play with him mm. as a young cat. Yeah. I, you, you hit it on the head. I just, it, it just didn't seem like that would be in the cards for me. And uh, um, I will say this: playing with Jackie McLean and in those formative years did uh, give me a, a sense of possibility and and open mindedness about the music and. Mm sort of you know playing with jackie yeah he he learned from bird and bud powell and miles and art blakey and charles mingus um and you know especially though when he talked about bird and bud and he's just a he loves that he loves bebop he's he's a hardcore bebopper mm. who also like your man Eric Dolphy, you know what I mean, and Ornette Coleman is is a pioneer. He's a yeah, yeah definitely yeah. adventurer. He was one of the early cats to play the new thing and and play play what we call yep. free jazz. And um, he had all of that going on. And so, <clears throat> um, what happened is that Avishai Cohen, the bassist from Israel, had he had come to the vanguard to hear j max band and we we met there and oh, okay. he liked my plan and and then i got to hear him at smalls and i was like man this cat has got some different stuff going on and it's pretty amazing and that was about it for a few years and then avishai called me to play in his band um and sub for avi avi libo libo yeah yeah yeah, great trombonist and and writer um, from he's back in Israel these days, but beautiful sound too, wonderful player. And so I thought I was just gonna do a couple gigs and you know and and it, it just kind of happened. It kind of worked. And Steve Wilson, our friend Steve Wilson, was was on that band too. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jeff Ballard and Jason Linder and. Yeah, kill, killing them. Yeah. Almost, uh, almost Hoffman on guitar. Yeah, on guitar. Yeah, yeah, beautiful player. Yeah. And then Jimmy Green started to do the gig um, a little later. Um, and when Avishai mentioned him, he's like, "Now, man, you you might know him. He's from Hartford." I just laughed. I said, "He was one of our students, man." Like, yeah, he's great. Get him, you know. So, um, Avishai's music is how I met Chick and. We did the first record, Adama, 
1997 at Clinton Studio, and Chick was producing. Oh, yeah, for Stretch, right? right? That was for Stretch. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So, again, wow, I'm going to meet Chick Corea in a working studio environment. How cool is that? I'm like 30 years old, you know, doing my thing. I thought, this is amazing. And that's going to be the end of it. (laughs) You know, like I, and it was just mind blowing that after that session, uh, Chick called and Avishai called me and said, man, Chick really digs the band. And look, bro, he loves your plan, man. And I was like, what? He said, oh, no, man, he's going to start this new sex Ted. I I think he's going to call you, man. I said, you, you, come on. No, nah, no, he's not, you know, and sure enough, he did. And, uh, and night later that summer in 97 and, uh, that's how origin started. But I remember this, Steve and I, uh, he had a soprano on that tune and we're standing there and chick in the booth and he hadn't said much during the date. And he says, Hey, uh, obviously can, can I just have my two cents for a minute with the horn players? <laughs> and so... Sure, maestro, of course. So he comes out of the booth. He's got the score of Avishai's music. He's looking at it. He's walking towards us. And Steve and I are just looking at each other like, "Uh uh-oh. You know, (laughs) like, not that he was imposing or anything, but just, oh, man. And so he comes over. He says, now, fellas, you guys sound great. I I, I love what you're doing. You you sound great together. You know, Miles used to tell us and i was like oh my god but i'd heard this kind of thing from jackie mclean before so it was different era but you know he says you know miles used to tell us that he when i was playing with miles he 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 had a way it didn't matter whose tune it was it could have been one of herbie's tunes it could have been one of wayne's tunes it could have been my tune it could have been a standard it or dave hollander you know it didn't matter he said Miles had a way of taking out a few notes, adding a few notes, and just within five minutes, making that song his song. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. He said, I want you guys to do that with uh, with this tune, Adama, Avishai's tune. Don't don't just play the pot, like with with the Boston accent, the part, you know, he said, don't just play the pot like you're, (laughs) which I love, you know. And he says... You know, don't just play the notes. Like, really make it your own. Can you guys do that? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Let's do another take. And, man, I got chills just thinking about it. Like, like, yeah, don't take the notes for granted. Don't just go through the motions, like, record date, hit the mm-hmm. parts. It says this. I play it. Like, oh, man, take it off the page. Like, like make it your song and so yeah. man it made such a difference and it stuck with me ever since uh just that commitment to to playing the notes mm-hmm. so so i you know years later when i was in origin chick chick used to call me uh <laughs> well he we'd be in rehearsal and he'd say hey steve and so wilson and i would both look <laughs> over and he said yeah, this is not really going to work, is it? He said, okay, uh, Stilson. That's, that stuck. That was funny. And then he said, Stavis. And we kind of went, eh, maybe not. <laughs> and then he said, no, Stilson and Davissimo, the oh, melody man. man. <laughs> that's beautiful. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So he used to call me Davissimo, you know? And, uh, ah, priceless, man. Uh, yeah. You know, so to go from... The messengers, the brief time, eight months or so, and 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 then all those years with Jay Mac as a student, as a band yeah. member, that was just an absolutely formative, huge experience. Uh, and then to move right into Chick and and do that, and all the while play with One for All and and yeah. you know uh, other great colleagues and Roy Hargrove and. Um, with his original big band in the nineties and wow, man, it, it, I'm just looking back on it. Just thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, but, but chick J Mac and chick really, man, they, they gave me a place to find my own voice mm. on the horn. And I'm eternally grateful to both of them. Yeah, sure. It's just sure. amazing. And you know, 
the, Beautiful, the, yeah. even though you wouldn't think, yeah, even though you wouldn't think of those two, Jackie McLean and Chick Corea, as together necessarily, they both come from the Miles Davis tree. Makes sense, you know. It's like, yeah. And they're both devoted to Bud Powell and Bird and and Bebop and standards and the blues and swinging, but they also it that's not enough. Like you can't yeah. just rest on that. They're they're always looking for something beyond. And one time I was playing with Jackie at the Vanguard and I'd been in the band a few years and so I got off a pretty decent solo and, and I actually felt like, man, I think I can actually live with that, you know? <laughs> And so J Mac knew me, man. He 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 knew my little self. So he looks over at me and, and he can tell, you know, I'm I'm sort of comfortable. And so right at that moment, he knew which button to push. He said, Ah, yeah, Stevie D. Uh-huh. Bebop City. Yeah, man. Okay. okay. <laughs> Meaning like, not now you can actually play. Now what? Exactly. What else you got? You got another gear? You got another gear? You know, it was like, wow, man. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. man. Wow. Amazing. Uh, what a blast. Amazing. Cool. Wow. Man, we got to play cool. together, man. Oh, man. Mm -hmm.